Bangladesh. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Venkat Ram, and he will be speaking on a very interesting subject, very difficult to control hypertension and approach. And to chair the session, we have Dr. V.S. Narayan, and Dr. Shivananda Dutta is here. Dr. Shivananda Dutta, if he's not there, Dr. Shomitra, are you here? Yes, I can see Dr. Shomitra. Okay, in that case, please, you, you please uh, chair the session. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Goha. And it is indeed my pleasure to be chairing a session uh, which is to be, you know, spoken by Dr. Ram, who is known to everybody, is the man who has taken hypertension management to different levels. And uh, we all know that hypertension is something which is easily manageable. But also we have a, a certain percentage of patients who are very difficult to manage. So let us see what Dr. Ram has to tell us about hypertension as a whole and how he plans or what algorithm he follows for the management of difficult to treat hypertension. So Dr. Ram, please. I don't see his slides up. Are they there? So, Dr. Ra, sir, you are not audible. Am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible yes, now. Yes. Now we can hear you. Okay, can I start? Uh, please. Yeah, please do. You first share the screen, sir. Yes. Okay, uh, let me. Okay, uh, uh, gentlemen, and uh, if some ladies are there, uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak on a somewhat of an unusual uh, topic uh, that Dr. Goha has assigned to me. Uh, Dr. Goha has asked me to speak on this very unusual type of hypertension that we see in clinical practice. The so, first, I want to make uh, very clear. We Excuse are talking me, about a patient who is compliant with treatment and compliant with uh, lifestyle changes and taking medications uh, quite regularly. That is the patient we are going to talk about, a patient with significant hypertension despite optimal therapy and despite reasonable compliance. Those are the things that uh, we are going to talk about uh, now. Now, uh, the term resistant or refractory hypertension is applied when a patient is requiring three or more antihypertensive drugs or if the patient's blood pressure is controlled on four or five antihypertensive drugs. So that is the definition of yeah. resistant hypertension. A patient who is compliant with uh, the prescription. So that is the key. Somebody who is requiring three, four, five medications to control the BP. Now there is a little bit of uh, controversy whether a diuretic should be a part of this three drug regimen. Uh, the guidelines do suggest that one of the three drugs should be a diuretic. But I am not sure whether a diuretic is always necessary to define somebody as refractory hypertension because once you add a diuretic, the blood pressure becomes responsive in most patients with hypertension. Now, the prevalence of difficult to control hypertension is quite variable because the definition is so loose. If you look at primary care physicians, the prevalence appears to be 20% or more. Specialty care such as cardiology or nephrology, the percentage appears to be 5%. But exactly what percentage of people have so-called true resistant hypertension is not known. Because the term resistant hypertension is used so loosely it is not like uh, malignancy where there is a marker. It is not like diabetes where there is a marker. The blood pressure varies so much. The prevalence of true resistant hypertension is not known and unlikely to be known. 
what are the reasons for so called difficult to control hypertension the factors could be patient related patient is unable to take the medications patient is unable to comply with the treatment patient is unable to follow lifestyle changes so those are related to the patient but there are factors attributable even to us to the medical profession doctor or the medical profession the factors that are attributable to the doctor or the medical profession is that we are not using optimal dosage of the drugs or we don't increase the medications on a regular basis for example i have seen patients who are taking 2.5 mg of phenylephrine i have seen patients who are taking uh, 25 mg of metoprolol and uh, the the dosage has not been increased so the things we have to keep in mind is the medical profession the medical system should always use optimal doses before labeling the patient as having difficult to control hypertension some patients might have underlying secondary cause that might be responsible for difficult to treat hypertension so ladies and gentlemen so the etiology of difficult to control hypertension is threefold patient related doctor or the medical system related and secondary causes of hypertension now uh, when patients have so called difficult to treat hypertension they have very very high risk of cardiovascular events this is a study that followed up patients for almost 4 uh, years where you see there is very high mortality in patients who have uncontrolled hypertension and that should not be surprising when patients have uncontrolled hypertension they have high mortality now start ko le if somebody, if somebody could mute their audio uh these are the things that we always have to keep in mind in uh, controlling difficult to control hypertension we have to ascertain salt intake physical fitness weight management decreasing alcohol and eliminating substances that could increase the blood pressure and you want to make sure that the patient is adherent to treatment one thing i want to point out no patient with hypertension is 100% compliant with treatment and you should not expect that because it is a, a asymptomatic condition even if they take it 80% of the time that is acceptable and these are the factors that one should consider these are the substances that could increase the blood pressure and that could interfere with the treatment of hypertension all of these are well known to you corticosteroids non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs uh various medications that could increase the blood pressure so when you see a patient with resistant hypertension please make sure that the patient is not taking any substances that could aggravate the blood pressure now the question is is the patient's blood pressure high only in the office or does the patient have so called white coat hypertension this was a study that was done many many years ago looking at the levels of blood pressure obtained by the doctor or by one of your staff members or by automated uh, device or by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring you will notice that the real blood pressure is not which we take or our nurses take but the blood pressure that is taken by automated devices or by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring so ladies and gentlemen i would strongly recommend that you try to embrace automated blood pressure measurement which is routinely available in india people talk about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring but that is not that easily available and most patients don't like it also so i would suggest that if you see a patient who has got resistant hypertension try to utilize any of the automated devices that are widely available uh, by the way almost all of them are quite dependable now i mentioned to you when you read articles or guidelines or even textbook chapters they always say that office bp home bp ambulatory blood pressure monitoring let me tell you you will end up using office blood pressure ma ma monitoring in most patients you will end up using office blood pressure monitoring 
not home BP, not 24-hour BP. Now, the key to control hypertension is kidney function. Let me, let me tell you, in almost uh, 40 years of my experience, it is extremely unusual to control hypertension in somebody who has got normal kidney function. In patients with normal kidney function, it is possible to control hypertension no matter what. Now, the choice of a diuretic. Some patients might be taking hydrochlorothiazide when they have declining renal function. You should switch them to a loop diuretic or to clotalidone. Once the GFR comes under 50 or 40 or serum creatinine goes about 1.4, 1.5, please switch the diuretic from hydrochlorothiazide to either clotalidone or to a loop diuretic. I'm going to talk about the combination of ACE and ARP. Uh, triple combination is well known to you. Ladies and gentlemen, do not hesitate to use triple drug combination. Combination of diuretic, CCB and ROS blocker. Do not be afraid that you cause hypotension. Hypotension from triple drug therapy in resistant hypertension is very unusual. So don't be afraid that you will precipitate hypotension by using triple drug therapy. And I want to comment later on on spironolactone, and I want to comment also later on on hydralazine and minoxidil. I do want to mention, gentlemen, when we are treating hypertension, there are four drugs we always forget in our clinical practice. One is hydralazine, other is minoxidil, other is spironolactone, other is moxonidine. For some reason, doctors forget these four drugs, which are very, very important to control resistant hypertension. There is one condition that uh, can be overlooked in resistant hypertension. It's a very common condition and it's very inexpensive to diagnose, namely hypothyroidism. Now, you look at this slide, it shows peripheral vascular resistance in patients with hypothyroidism and hypertension. In hypothyroidism and hypertension, the peripheral vascular resistance goes up. So in a patient who has hypothyroidism, the blood pressure goes up significantly. Now you look at this slide, in patients with hypothyroidism, you can treat their hypertension with antihypertensive drugs, or you can treat their hypothyroidism with thyroid replacement. That, that result is the same. You will notice in uncontrolled hypertension and hypothyroidism, if you replace thyroid and make the patient euthyroid, the blood pressure becomes normal. One take home point for all of you, all of us, who resist in hypertension, please get T3, T4, TSH because it's an easy condition to treat. I have seen many patients with resistant hypertension who respond to thyroid replacement. Very easy, very simple, and very inexpensive test. Uh, in the evaluation of patients with uh, hypertension, very simple thing, kidney function, electrolytes, echocardiogram for LVH, and evaluate the patient for peripheral arterial disease. I want to mention about spironolactone. This is a drug that we tend to forget in uh, practice. Many studies have shown when you add spironolactone in patients with resistant hypertension, the blood pressure goes down. You'll show on this slide that when low dose spironolactone, 25 milligram was added, there was a remarkable fall in blood pressure. So one take home message is in patients with resistant do not forget to use spironolactone as long as the patient does not have chronic kidney disease hyperkalemia. This is one more study looking at the blood pressure response to spironolactone. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look at this slide. Look at systolic blood pressure baseline and during treatment with spironolactone as an add-on treatment. You will notice when spironolactone was added, there was a significant reduction in blood pressure, but make sure the patient 
can tolerate spironolactone and has does not have hyperkalemia all of you are familiar with ascot everybody in india all doctors in india know about ascot trial in ascot trial there were some patients who were unresponsive to three drugs but when they added spironolactone there was a fall in blood pressure so adding spironolactone can reduce the blood pressure now the question is what is the mechanism by which spironolactone appears to improve blood pressure control looks like it relaxes the blood vessels this is an experimental study looking at vascular stiffness uh, with aldosterone which is open circles and vascular stiffness with an aldosterone antagonist you will notice when aldosterone antagonist was added the vascular stiffness decreased so it looks like the dominant mechanism of action of spironolactone is that it reverses vascular stiffness in patient with resistant hypertension there is one combination that i am going to suggest but you should be very very careful this is in patients who have diabetes and refractory hypertension this is a study using a combination of ace inhibitor and erb you will notice when ace inhibitor and erb are used in combination there was a greater fall in blood pressure remember all the guidelines recommend that you should not use combination of ace and erb that is correct but in patients who have diabetes and resistant hypertension combination therapy shown here on the red color lowers the blood pressure but please follow the patient's potassium and creatinine it's a very unusual combination you can use it as long as you monitor the patient's potassium and creatinine now look at this slide reduction in proteinuria with erb reduction in proteinuria with an ace inhibitor and when you combine them there was a further reduction in proteinuria so in diabetic patients with resistant hypertension when you combine ace plus erb not only the blood pressure falls down but the proteinuria in decreases further no guidelines suggest this by the way no guidelines would suggest this but as a clinician you can use this treatment as long as you follow the patient's creatinine and potassium now i mentioned to you about choosing the right diuretic this is a study in refractory hypertension where the patients were taking hydrochlorothiazide but when they were switch to chlorthalidone there was a fall in blood pressure so first thing that you should do in patient with resistant hypertension if they are on hydrochlorothiazide switch them to chlorthalidone or based upon renal function to a loop diuretic you can see Very quickly i want to comment on uh, about few secondary causes i already mentioned about thyroid in mm -hmm. and gentlemen all the doctors we want to do angiogram we want to do carotid doppler we want to do all kinds of tests but please get t3 and tsh in patients with resistant hypertension very easy to treat and you should remember about other secondary causes that are mentioned here i will not go into details but keep in mind what secondary cause i want to mention is obstructive sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea is an important cause of resistant hypertension this is a slide looking at the relationship between obstructive sleep apnea and hypertension you will notice as obstructive sleep apnea gets worse hypertension gets worse in important relationship between obstructive sleep apnea and resistant hypertension but when you give cpap oh by the way i have never met a patient who follow cpap 100% and you will never meet but even if they take cpap 50% of the time the blood pressure goes down in resistant hypertension so ladies and gentlemen keep in mind the possibility of obstructive sleep apnea when you see patients with resistant hypertension if you confirm the diagnosis ask them to take cpap they don't like it uh, but it does help lower the bp look at this patient of mine seen at apollo many years ago the blood pressure 160 or 110 on multiple drugs on multiple drugs 160 or 
when the patient was uh, prescribed CPAP and he followed, the blood pressure became 120 by 80 in two months. So, in obstructive sleep apnea, CPAP therapy does help. In some patients, it could be due to renal artery stenosis. So keep in mind the possibility of renal artery stenosis or tachyusis arteritis in patients with resistant hypertension based upon clinical evaluation. Now, I want to end with one case of resistant hypertension. Now, I want all the attendees to look at the blood pressure before. In this 34-year-old patient, look at the blood pressure 180 by 120 on multiple medicines. Look at the potassium, 2.3. So this is a patient who was referred to me for resistant hypertension on multiple drugs. And when I looked at the potassium, it was 2.3. I asked the patient, okay. did you have low potassium before? She said she had low potassium for 10 years. Yeah. And the doctors just told her to take bananas, bananas, bananas. By the way, bananas don't replace potassium deficiency. It's a potassium supplement. You can never correct potassium deficiency by fruits or vegetables. They are potassium supplements, not potassium substitutes. So the patient had primary hyperaldosteronism. I had her adrenal tumor removed. And look at the blood pressure after removal of adrenal tumor. 110 by 80, no medicines, zero medicines. And look at the potassium, 4.5. So ladies and gentlemen, if your patient has resistant hypertension and has inexplicable low potassium, consider the possibility of primary hyperaldosteronism. Look at this patient's blood pressure. This is very, very classic. So the patient had workup and the patient had a renal CT which showed the tumor and that it was removed, the patient became normal. And this is the patient's blood pressure before adrenalectomy and after adrenalectomy, completely normal. But don't do unnecessary workup, only when you suspect primary hyperaldosteronism. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't want to comment on device-based uh, therapy because I'm running out of time. But baroreceptor activation therapy has been shown to reduce the blood pressure. It is experimental. And this is a study in resistant hypertension with baroreceptor activation therapy. It remains experimental. It is not being used clinically. There is a controversy of renal denervation therapy. Uh, there is a renewed interest in renal denervation therapy I'm not sure about the future of renal denervation therapy. You will notice when uncontrolled studies were released, there was a lot of enthusiasm. When placebo-controlled trials were released, the enthusiasm gone down. Now it is going up again a li little bit. So uncontrolled studies have shown that renal denervation therapy is helpful. But when you do sham control studies, you see the blood pressure response is not that much. Uncontrolled studies, dramatic fall in blood pressure. Double-blinded randomized trials were done. You'll notice the result was not that great. And when you do renal denervation, three things happen. And you can't predict. Blood pressure might go down. The blood pressure may not change. But the blood pressure might go up in some people. Can you believe? This is the only procedure that I know where you do something to reduce the blood pressure and it actually goes up in some people. So renal denervation therapy has a wide range of blood pressure responses. And uh, this is the trial which was placebo sham control showed that renal denervation therapy might not help. But fortunately, there is some hope for renal denervation therapy. This is the global registry results that were published in uh, JAK uh, last month, where the global uh, registry, mainly from Europe, has shown that in follow-up, their patients appear to respond to the treatment. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the future, renal denervation therapy will depend on the type of patient, the type of technique, 
the type of renal ablation. And in my opinion, only people who are experts in this field should do it. It is not ready for prime time. And there is a, okay, there is a condition called refractory resistance deficiency. There is a condition called refractory resistant hypertension. I wrote editorial in it a few years ago. Refractory resistant hypertension, new terminology for an old problem. It means there are some patients who take medications to do everything right, but the blood pressure does not respond. The blood pressure does not respond. And we don't know why. We don't know why in some people the blood pressure does not respond. Now, this is my last slide. This is a patient uh, I have seen in Hyderabad. Look at the medication the patient is taking. Patient is taking uh, Santana oil be done in another two minutes. Uh, Prezosin, 10 milligram. Triple drug therapy once daily. Aldactone, 200 milligram. Lebetalol, 300 milligram. Mo Moxonidine, 0 0.9 milligram. Minoxidil, 75 milligram. Ladies and gentlemen, Santano, Minoxidil, 75 milligram is equal to 3,000 milligram of hydralazine. Three grams of hydralazine. And the patient is also on thoracemide, 10 milligram twice daily. Negative workup, negative workup. 24 hour blood pressure, severe uncontrolled hypertension, severe uncontrolled hypertension, 24 hour BP. We admitted the patient to the hospital to make sure that the patient is compliant. She was in the hospital for four days. All the four days, we administered these drugs that you see on the slide. The nurse administered this medicine, made sure the patient swallowed the medicine, and the patient swallowed the medication for four to five days, and the average blood pressure in the hospital was 180 by 120. 180 by 120. And the patient was taking the medication. We don't know why. Negative workup, negative workup. So ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude uh, by suggesting that uh, it's a, it's a different entity called very difficult to treat hypertension. I mentioned to you the definition of difficult to treat hypertension. I mentioned to you possible contributing factors, the patient, the doctor, the system. I also mentioned to you the tricks to treat difficult to treat hypertension by choosing a diuretic, by using triple drug therapy by not forgetting hydralazine, don't forget minoxidil, don't forget spironolactone. But when I say spironolactone, I'm also suggesting keep an eye on the patient's renal function and patient's creatinine. And I told you something today that nobody would have shown you publicly, the combination of ACM bitter ERB. Nobody will show it because the guidelines oppose it. But in some patients, you can use it as long as you take care of the patient's creatinine and potassium, you can help them. But uh, you can treat refractory hypertension in every patient who has normal renal function. But there are some patients that I showed you, the last one, Mrs. Kalra, who have so-called resistant refractory No matter what you do, the blood pressure doesn't come down. Negative workup. Uh, that patient had PET, MIBG, you name it, never comes down. So I hope, Santano, I met with your expectations. Uh, I see Dr. H.K. Chopra there, he joined. And uh, yeah. if there is any time, any comments or questions, they're most welcome. So with your permission, I'll conclude at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Narayan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sub. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, there are some questions also in the chat box. I think since you emphasize quite a little bit on the combination therapy with ACE and ARBs and you also instilled some fear into the minds of the people at which was already existing that you need to take care of the potassium and the renal function. The question that has come up, how frequently should you be checking the potassium and the, and the renal functions once you start with that combination if you decide to do so? And my question would be to whether this could only be used in cases of resistant hypertension or could you use this combination with care even in patients who have complicated hypertension in terms of heart failure and, and coronary syndromes? 
Okay, first of all, Varun, I just want to make it very clear so that uh, I don't, uh, so that I'm not condemned. Uh, guidelines oppose combination A plus CRB. But in diabetic patients who have refractory hypertension, when you combine them, the blood pressure comes down, the proteinuria comes down. But then the onus is on you to monitor the creatinine and potassium. Not, by the way, as long as you monitor the patient, it's fine. But you should use this only in patients with resistant hypertension, but not in patients who have uh, responsive hypertension. In congestive heart... How frequently the question, Atmos? Uh, how frequently? Okay, in patients who have normal renal function, there is no recommendation on how frequently you need to monitor their potassium and creatinine. But if the serum creatinine is more than 1.5, that means stage 2, 3 chronic kidney disease, one should get it at least once in six months or once in two months, potassium or creatinine. Or if the patient doesn't want to come, ask the patient to get it some elsewhere, you should know about it. I would get it once in six weeks to two months because you don't want suddenly the patient nine months later to have potassium 5.8 and ECG showing tall peak T waves. So you monitor them as good doctors. We should always monitor what we do in those patients. And... Uh Eplerinone is also as good? Eplerinone? Eplerinone? Are, no, it's a, it's a question. Eplerinone, there are no studies doing it. But if you have a patient who says that I don't want gynecomastia, I don't want to take this drug, you can try eplerinone. You know, one thing about medical practice and about good doctors is that we are not imprisoned. We are not in a prison. You can always do these things as long as you take responsibility for the patient. And you would not consider centrally acting drugs anymore, the ones which you used in the past, methyl dopa, clonidine, etc. You don't think they have any place now? No, the only thing is, uh, I mean, obviously they were important. The only thing is they are not well tolerated. The reason why I recommended moxonidine is the comparative studies with clonidine have shown that it is less likely to cause dry mouth less likely to cause sedation. Efficacy is the same. Efficacy is the same. If you want to use methyl dopa, clonidine, fine. But the tolerability is greater with moxonidine. Oh, by the way, the other point, I see wonderful cardiologists on the screen, including the people uh, in the blue, blue jacket. Uh, congestive heart failure is a malignant disorder. And in malignancy, you try your best. <laughs> You try your best to save the patient, oncologists. So cardiologists are really oncologists treating congestive heart failure. And in congestive heart failure, not responding to the usual therapy, you try the combination of ACE plus ERB. Again, keeping in mind the safety test of potassium creatinine. People use it all the time in, in uh, class four heart failure combination, but you need to monitor the patient to be certain that you are not producing hyperkalemia and creating the risk of sudden death. So thank Dr. you very Shomitra. much. Shomitra, want to have, have a comment? Just very quick comment Please. for the general practitioners. Number one comment is that obstructive sleep apnea, you really require a very high threshold of suspicion and at least 40% of people are non-obese. So that is a very important message, I think. In, even in thin people, you should think of if there is history of snoring. Number two for general physicians, before starting hypertensive therapy, because you will do it, we don't get the patient without antihypertensive. Please check the sodium, potassium, urea, creatinine as a baseline. You will never get that opportunity in your lifetime once the patient is already on medicine. Even right. if you don't see it, keep it in your file. It will help us later on. These are okay. the two messages I give. Now, Santana, I'll respond to him. Uh, Saumitra, uh, Sao kya, hazar, karor mitra hai usme, so, uh, is absolutely correct. Obstructive apnea, the, the morphological profile is obesity and short neck. That is typical profile, Pickwickian syndrome. But you can see obstructive sleep apnea in patients who are not obese, who have long necks, and uh, even they may not have snoring. But if they have resistant hypertension, it's not a bad idea to get a sleep test done because if it shows severe apnea, hypopnea index, you recommend oxygen. And some people comply with oxygen. It's worth doing it. Now, 
is what Somitra has said is absolutely 100% correct. You must never start the patient, especially on a diuretic, unless you know the patient's electrolytes. Because once you don't do sodium and potassium as baseline, you will miss so many other diagnoses. Please do it. You know, I'll, I'll mention, I, I have seen in my life patients carrying medical records so big on their head, 100 echoes, 100 TMCs, 1,000 coronary angiograms, 1,000 Dopplers, but I can't see creatinine, I can't see sodium, I can't see potassium. Please, poor man's test, sodium, potassium, creatinine, proteinuria. Proteinuria is more powerful, I'm sorry to say, Santano, than echocardiogram in predicting the patient's cardiovascular prognosis. So please, poor man's test, sodium, potassium, creatinine, urinalysis, and you can treat the patient. Thank you, sir. I Thank you very much. Close the session, huh? I remember one of my senior professors, he would add a small dose of thyroxine with every case of hypertension. <laughs> Only if they have hypothyroidism. <laughs> so he would do it in every case. Every okay. hypertensive, we as interns and house officers were instructed to add two point, you know, a bit of thyroxine. So I think it goes with your concept that thyroid functions, I think, are also important as far as you know treatment of resistant hypertension is concerned. So I think it is a wonderful uh, presentation, and thank you very much, Dr. Ram. Thank you.